What is good, good people? You are now listening to another episode of Since We Last Spoke with Danny Foxworth. I am your humble narrator, Danny Foxworth, and once again, we're joined by an extremely special guest. I had the pleasure of chopping it up with this brother in real life. Again, if you know me, you know that I'm good on meeting your internet. I'm big on meeting your internet friends in real life. And I had the pleasure of chopping it up with this good brother right here at J Live's birthday bash a few months back. And we chopped it up. And, you know, I'm glad that he's on here. He's a uh, he's a uh, Charleston, South Carolina hip hop producer. Uh, he's produced for the likes of Big Poo, Blue, Micah Nine, Guilty Simpson. Man, the list goes on and on. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have the great Freshman Woes in the building. Freshman Woes, what's good, Yo, man? Thank you for having me, man. I've been looking forward to this. It's a privilege. Yeah, you and me both. So, um, from what I understand, you uh grew up in a military family, and y'all y'all moved around a lot. So, that's talk true. Talk about what it was like being a military brat. Man, it was like. It was kind of like being a part of like a secret society because even I grew up like where I spent most of my time was in North Dakota. Really? And, then, and people think like there's nothing up there in North Dakota, but we we lived on base and me and my friends like man, because I think because there was nothing, like we looked to like hip hop and things like that, and we just we absorbed that and it became everything to us. Wow. So, you would think like, oh man, what are they doing up there? But man, we I have nothing but good memories about growing up up there. We were so into music. We were in art. I had friends that were into graffiti. Just every aspect of hip hop, like we were trying to do it, man, because we knew we were far away from it. So mm -hmm. it, it was in our eyes, we were just trying to be a, as authentic with it as we could. I love it. So what was your what was your uh, earliest musical memory? Uh, making pause tapes and like recording songs on the radio, like the same thing that everybody does. Like you just wait until you hear that song and then you hit pause. And then from there, I started like trying to make my own little mixes and everything. And that was probably the genesis of like all my production was pause tapes. Nice, nice, man. People can't still know about them pause tapes, man. That's that's no. you taking it back. <laughs> I love and that it. dedication right there like when you have no equipment all you got is is that dual deck like yeah it's ingenuity at its finest so who <laughs> were who were some of your early influences as far as your production as far as my production i would say probably like dr dre death row all that stuff was huge on me and then dungeon family um the Soul Quarians, that whole movement, Ruckus. I'd say that's like the foundation of everything that I love. Yeah. And one of the things that I enjoy the most about your production is you sample, but you also incorporate live instrumentation with the samples as well. So I yeah. I definitely I definitely get the organized noise vibe and the and the Dre vibe, man. That's those yeah. are some those are some uh, great those are some great uh examples. And even later, later, like probably my top three favorite of all time, Alchemist, Mugs, and Madlib. Ooh. And, I, and Madlib and Mugs used a lot. Of, people don't realize it, but they used a lot of live production as well. Like, so I tried to like be like guys like that. Like, um, you didn't know if you was hearing the sample, if you're hearing the live instrumentation, it all kind of blended together. That that means you did your job, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. Matter of fact, whenever we uh whenever we chopped it up at J Live's birthday shindig, I just remember I just remember being so excited because I didn't know anybody else that could nerd out over the Stone Throw catalog as much as me, and I met my match. Oh man. Because I mean Golly, this was like my, I want to say this was like my freshman year in college. And I was, I was all in, man. That peanut butter wolf. Then we talked about Rasco and Loot Pack. Rasco. I'm like, man, let's go. Rasco and Cali Agents, man. Cali Those Agents. guys were like foundational to me. That's why I, eventually I got to work with Planet Asia. And mm -hmm. I, just, I just, all I could do was dumb out because I was like, man, I used to listen to this guy in high school. Like, yeah. I remember I remember when that Cali agents dropped and I remember hearing Planet Asia on that dilated people's uh mm -hmm. the very first album, the platform. Yep. 
that's why I like to work with him, man. It meant so much to me. And and I still love everything he does. He's still doing after all these years, he's still putting out dope projects with whether it's evidence, Apollo Brown, like yep. I'm still a fan. So um just go into your your uh, production process. So do you normally make the beat first or do you find the sample first? It starts with the sample and then I make the beat and I say it's about 50-50 after that to where I'll either know that I can do this on my own or a lot of times I'll start to hear the musicians on it before and I'll be like, no, I need to get somebody to play on this. And that's when I'll I'll push it to them. So it, it really goes 50-50, but most of it starts in the record shop in them dollar bins trying to find samples. So t take us into the uh, the art of of digging for the for the sample. Like when you're in the record store and then like you put your headphones on and you just rummaging through the uh rummaging through the vinyl and then you're like, oh, and then a light bulb goes off. What what what's uh take take us into the mind of freshman woes whenever you find that sample and you're like, I can't wait to get home and chop this up. Well, I don't even listen to it in the store. Okay. Most of the time I'm going off of all right, I think this is this genre. And I know I do well in this genre. I know I do well in this time frame. Like right now, I've been uh, sampling a lot of old psychedelic rock records. And I've been in that bag real hard right now. Like, yeah, I know if I can find some stuff like that, if it's got a, if I see it's from a certain time frame and then they're playing, they got a lot of guitars and they have synthesizers on it. I'm like, probably, and it's got a weird cover. Like, I'm like, all right, I think I might be able to work with this. Man, the the album cover art, that's 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 such a crucial decision maker right there. Because I do the same <laughs> thing whenever I'm shopping for vinyl. Like, if I'm thumbing through and I'm like, ooh, I like this record. I think I'm, a, I'm yeah, I'll go with this one. Yeah, it's, it's funny how you can just pick a record just based off off the vibe of it. Just the like the vibe of the album cover. Album covers, that's 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 like a lost art. That's exactly you took the words out of my mouth. That's what I was gonna say. It's a lost art. Sometimes back in the day, you would just see a crazy album cover, you would buy that yeah. just off the album cover. Yes. And so, it's still yeah. like I like I'll look at how many people are playing on it. Oh, they got somebody playing a vibraphone on here. They right. like the the more people they got playing on it. The, the chances are there's probably some heat on there. Yes, indeed. So um who was who was your um who was your first placement? And that, that's the thing with my music. I haven't never I've never like shopped around trying to get my beats placed. Oh, really? And I probably <laughs> because I was always living like when I lived in California, I lived like three miles or uh, three hours away from Los Angeles. I was okay. in the 805. Um, so I was up the, in between like Santa Barbara and San Francisco. So I was kind of out there on my own out there. So I've never had like a scene where I was just shopping my beats. So when I make a beat, I usually like, that's going to be for one of my projects. But my first big placement, uh, like of getting somebody of note to rap on my stuff was blue. All right. So what, how did you, how did that process go about? Did you reach well, out to him? I had met him at shows multiple times to where we, he started to know me. I was promoting for nature sounds at the, at that time. Oh, nature sounds. Bro, so you took it back. There was a uh, there was a show where I chopped it up with him and I had all the promotional stuff and he was about to go on tour so I, I he ended up getting a bunch of uh the stuff I had to bring on tour with him. And th from there he remembered me. So I was like, all right, I got the end. So I, I hit him up. And when I hit him up, he was like, oh, yeah, of course. But for him to be the first person, that meant a lot to me because he's one of my favorite ever as well. Absolutely, man. Blue, that blue is the so heavens, dope. Man, that oh, changed that, my life. That blue in exile. Yes. Yes. They're like an institution. And so, man, I just remember being dumbfounded, just looking at the email where he said yes. And I, and just 
geeking out over that, man. Yeah. All it takes is that one yes, and you're off to the races. Exactly. So um, let's see. You know, let's get into your discography. So um, what was the what was the first project that you released? The first thing I did was a 45. It was uh rap dudes featuring homeboy Sandman, Blame One, and my guy DJ Ma from St. Louis. And then the B side was more rap dudes that had Blue, Planet Asia, and MED. And though I put those songs out during uh 2020 in COVID. Because I at that time, I was going through a divorce, and I was kind of to the point where I was like, I don't know even know if I'm gonna be able to keep doing this music. Yeah. So, but I at that time I was sitting on j- some joints, and I was like, I can't just let these live on my hard drive. So, I was, you would say I was at rock bottom, but I was like, I'm gonna get these off. If if this is it, I'm gonna get these off. So I started putting out one song. A month during during 2020 i started in january and i went well into the summer i think i released like seven singles and and those were the the two most popular ones so we pressed them up and we did a 45 of those and that was my first freshman world's release so when you reached out to the other artists was it the same approach that you used with blue yeah i had a relationship uh with MED, we had, we had met several times and chopped it up. I didn't know Planet Asia, but at the time when I sent him uh, the song, it already had blue on it. So he was like, okay. yeah, this is dope. Like, let's do yeah. it. And then um, Homeboy Sandman and Blame One, I just reached out to them and it was like, hey, I'm trying to work with other artists. And they they were both really receptive to doing it. That dope, dope, dope. So, um... Thank you, Rap Gods. Yeah, that was that was that was the project that really that I became familiar with with your work. So, that was my baby, man. Yeah, I I love that <laughs> record. Thank you, man. So um, how how did that uh, what was the process of like putting that album together? So once I finished that single run during 2020, that kind of put the battery back in my back. And I'm like, oh man, people are actually enjoying these, like we got recognition like we were getting played on shade 45 at that time i really? started I, I was making playlists from okay player rhyme sayers like all these all these like institutions that i grew up idolizing and started to acknowledge it and i'm like yo i got to keep doing it. i can't stop now yeah so what i end up doing i had the seven or eight songs and then i did some new songs and then we packaged it and i put out the lp Thank you, Rap Gods. And that was my debut. Um, yeah, now I'm working on the follow-up to that. It's called Tribe Called Fresh. And that'll be coming out June 21st. And then hopefully this is uh, the stepping off point to where I'm ready to really start amping up my output and releasing a lot more music. Yeah, I love that lead single, The Effortless. Oh, thank you, oh, man. Oh man, that's that's a groove right there. Thank you. Then like Fashion batting batting lead off and they getting into the he's getting into that double time. I'm like, oh bro, I went so hard on the stairmaster on Sunday <laughs> listening to that joint, man. Seriously. Oh Fashion, man, he's somebody who I was a huge fan of. And when I got that verse, it was like it was so satisfying just because that's probably my favorite verse of his now. And it's yeah. my shit. Like Yes. Yes. I'm so I was so geeked off that. And I actually sat on that for a long time. And the second verse was just empty. And I ended up getting an elemental on that at the end of last year. And he and he just he complimented it so perfect. Mm-hmm. Fit the beat, but it was different than what fast man. Game over. That's one of my favorite yes. songs. That oh my god, bro. You have no idea how many times I replayed that song. Like ah, seriously. Thank you. I, I love that shit. Man, so um understand your kids are also into uh in the music. So are they are they as immersed in the hip hop as you are? No, that's the thing. Uh really. You can't choose what your kids do. They're always they're gonna probably do the opposite of you. So my son, he has a good 
foundational like knowledge of hip hop. The hip hop he likes is very good, but he's mostly mm -hmm. into rock music. Okay. But it's still the fact that we can still uh I guess nerd out over music in general is a blessing in itself. And uh now that I got this new spot, he's actually been trying to play on some of my stuff. And we haven't got one yet, but when we get one, that's gonna be so special. Yes, indeed. So um I want to go back just a little bit here because it was something sure. I completely overlooked. Sure. Li living in St. Louis, what was that experience like? Because that St. Louis is that's that's one of my favorite cities. Really? Yeah. Um, see, I you touched on it. I was a military brat, and my father is from Illinois. So I lived when I was a kid, I lived in North Dakota. Like all through elementary school and then junior high, I lived down south in Mississippi, actually. And we were down there for a few years. But in high school, my dad retired from the Air Force and he said, we're going back home to Illinois. So I, I grew up in, in Springfield, Illinois. And we were always going to St. Louis. Like that's that's the only thing there. Because Springfield is the capital city, but it's more like a big town. So when you want uh, when you want to do something fun, you want to go to Six Flags, Cardinals game, you're you're constantly going to St. Louis. Yeah. So as soon as I could graduate and get out, I went to St. Louis. And then I pretty much spent 10, 12 years going back and forth between California and St. Louis for work. Like a, okay. position, a position would open up in California. I go out there for a few years. Position would open up in St. Louis. I go back. And I just I kept going back and forth. So how and, far how far is Springfield from St. Louis? Uh, about an hour and a half. Okay, that's not bad at all. No, not at all. Um, but St. Louis was the first place where I, like I cut my teeth in a hip hop scene. I was uh promoting, doing street team promotions, and I was I was entrenched. If there was something going on with hip hop, I was doing it. But that was before I was actually doing music myself. Like I was doing music back then, but I wasn't mm -hmm. putting out nothing. I kind of just kept it to myself. Okay. Man, I remember the, the first time I went to St. Louis was 2011. And I just went I went to go catch a Cardinals game and spend a weekend there. And I'll never forget, I ate at a spot called uh, Tutenberg's Deli. And to this day, that is the best Reuben sandwich I've ever had in my entire life. Man. And um, also... I hear a lot of good, I hear a lot of people from St. Louis speak highly of the Chinese food in St. Louis. There's, I don't know what it is. Hmm. They, they, they like, I I didn't try it, but they always, it's, they say it's just like a, 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 some kind of like a very unique way that the, the, the Chinese food places in St. Louis cook their food. And I, every person I know from St. Louis always talk highly of, of their Chinese food scene there. So next time I go you're, there, I'm definitely going to try uh, cut my teeth, so to speak. You're putting me up on game because I, <laughs> I didn't even know that. Yeah. So um, then you moved to South Carolina. Yep. So what, what was that adjustment like for you? Man, it was different. Um, how I said I would take these jobs out there or wherever I was at, like me and my family would be there, but I'd be traveling a lot for work. And when I had this opportunity came up, I could come down here in 2016. And the job was in Sumter, South Carolina. Wow. I don't know anything. I don't know anything about South Carolina, <laughs> but I know all I know for this job is I would get a promotion. I wouldn't have to travel anymore. Oh, nice. And I knew at that time, like that's what. I was having too good a time in California and I wasn't, I wasn't focused and I knew I kind of need to get disciplined. Like I need to finish my degree. Mm -hmm. I need at that time I had some bills I needed to pay. I need to get financially straight. So I had a lot of personal goals that I was like, man, it's going to be a lot harder. If you stay out here in California and do all this, you could just go down to South Carolina, knock everything out. You don't got no distractions down there. So that and then you're always going to be home. My son, my sons were getting older. So me being away was getting harder and harder. Yeah. People will say the opposite. 
like once they get older, it's easier. But no, the older they get, the harder it gets because that's when they need you there. So I took this job down here and I was in Sumter for, man, up until 2016 to 2023. And then, and you, then, moved, moved, to and then you moved to Charleston. And man, Sumter, I love it. I love it for what it did for me. But as far as like recreational stuff, it left a lot to be desired, man. Yeah. I was I was constantly uh, going to Columbia, Charlotte. And that's when uh, I, I started meeting like Preach Jacobs. And when yeah. he was doing stuff in Columbia, I started seeing him at all the same events. And then we started chopping it up. So... I was like, oh, there is people like me out here. <laughs> you yep. know, I mean? <laughs> because for a while I just felt like, man, like I feel like an alien down here. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your first impressions of Charleston? Oh man, Charleston, I love it. This is the after being in Sumter for so long, it's been a minute since I lived somewhere where I'm just I'm in infatuated with the city man i'm excited to be here so far it seems like there that there's history it's beautiful the i just look around and it's beautiful here it, the music scene seems seems amazing and that's one thing that i love too because now like i live somewhere where i can actually go play out and i can go meet other rappers like man i'm just i feel blessed and i'm happy to be here I feel like more people should be repping for Charleston. Like who, if you think about it, like who's came from Charleston, we, you should be excited to be down here. Cause we could be the first ones. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like there hasn't been anybody to put a stamp on it. And I see so much potential down here because like, it's unique. It's its own thing. Yeah. And I just feel like it will take the right person to put a spotlight on that and make it happen. Hopefully I can help do that. Word up, man. You, you're you the right man for the job. That's for sure. Thank you. So now we're going to get into the five question segment. So the first and last question I ask every guest I have on here, questions two through four are 100% random. So question number one, what were your go-to school lunch items? My go-to school lunch items. I'm going to be honest with this. I used to get money for lunch all the time. Mm -hmm. And I would never spend that money on lunch i would always be buying records <laughs> so i didn't have any school lunch man because i was always okay. saving my money to buy records <laughs> hey it turned out to be a smart move <laughs> <laughs> that's true uh question number two if you could be any animal what animal would you be Hey, right now I'm gonna say alligator, man, because I'm obsessed with these alligators down here. I never lived <laughs> anywhere that had any, and to me, it's the it's it's the neatest thing to be able to just see some alligators chilling outside. Yeah, and I love it every time I go to your IG story and I see you take a pic butt right there at the <laughs> pond, and I see, and you see the alligators right there chilling. At some point, <laughs> I I gotta have an alligator themed project, man. I don't, I don't know if it's gonna be beats, it's gonna be something, but. Man, I just feel like it's destined. Dope. Uh, question number three. What was your favorite childhood book? Uh, the Ego Trip Book of Rap List. You know about yes! that? I had that book. I don't know <laughs> where in the world that book went, but I had it. Yeah, you know, I wore that thing out, man. And then in the back, it had all the best albums by every year. Mm -hmm. The ones I didn't have, I would mark it. I'd be trying to find them albums. Yes. Yeah, man. That book gave me so much joy on so many levels. Bro, all the different rappers taking pictures with the Bismarcky puppet. Yep. Oh, man. <laughs> I don't know. I wish I, had, I wish I had something way deeper, but... Honestly, that's it for me, man. Hey, that that works for me too. That was one of my favorite books ever. And I'm just, it bothers me that I don't know where in the hell I put that book. Same. Man. So uh, question number four, what was your first car? My first car was a Ford Escape and I bought it when I was like 21 years old. Everyone said, this is your first car, but man, I didn't have a lot of money growing up. So it took me a minute to be able to get have a car. Yeah. So I was blessed to have that car. And I still uh, look back at it fondly. 
the whole bump the back bumper was covered in rap stickers like <laughs> you couldn't put one more sticker on there man man i remember my first car was a uh, it was actually a 1984 nissan 200 x sx uh turbo hatchback that my mom passed down to me it was just sitting in the it was sitting in our backyard collecting dust and <laughs> just right around the time i got my driver's license and you know she needed her she had got a chevy astro van so i I was at the point where i was able to drive and she was like you know what let's uh just take this to the mechanic and bring it back to life but unbeknownst to me it was a stick shift and I knew oh. nothing about driving stick. And I had my first trial by fire lesson driving to school. From my house to the high school was probably a eight-minute drive. And it took me almost an hour to get to school because I kept I kept stalling out so much. That was the most frustrating How shit. How long ever. did it take you? How long what, did it take you to get it? What to uh get this master the stick shift? Or you took yeah. um man. Probably about three weeks. Okay. Yeah. It, it 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 took me it took me a second, but I was able to uh I was able to nail it down. My car my current car is a stick shift actually, so it's like revisiting my high school years all over again. Then uh question number <laughs> yeah, five. I, I've never drove a stick to this day. No kidding. Yeah. You're not missing out on anything. <laughs> <laughs> Man, uh, it's, it's 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 cool, but it's a it's too much work. I I should have yeah, just gotten. Yeah, it seems like a lot of work, man. Yeah. <laughs> Especially like you parked on the incline, and then whenever the the light turns green, and you and you got to keep the car from, you know, moving backwards before you take your foot off the clutch. I don't know what the hell I was thinking getting the stick shift again, <laughs> but whatever. Then last question. All right. What was the last thing that really made you laugh? And the last, I think I was watching like Key and Peele or something with my wife. Just yeah. Some mindless Netflix and there was something dumb on there that just had me like dying laughing. Okay. Okay. Um, that was uh, time to plug your shit. So anything you got want to plug or promote, the floor is officially yours. Um... Yeah, I got the new project coming out, A Tribe Called Fresh. It'll be out June 21st. Um, we got Fashion, Elemento, and Mike and I for Freestyle Fellowship on the lead single. Also got um, Haslo. Um, who else we got there? Cash is King, AJ Swade. I got Chuck D from Public Enemy on a skit on there. What? Yep. Bro. Um, how did how did you land that? Man, it's one of the craziest things that happened. He ended up just being a big supporter of mine ever since uh I've had he has a radio station network rap station. Yeah. And he has a show on there called Hip Hop Gods, and they started playing my music. And then from there, then he started playing my music, and he just ended up being one of my biggest supporters, man. Like, wow. <laughs> It's something I could have never guessed, and I'm still, it's so surreal, but he did a drop for me on his show, and then I was like, of course, I got to use this on the album, man. Right? <laughs> man, so... We so, got uh, on the album, ahead. and yeah, it's, it's my, second, my second release, and I couldn't ask for any more right now, man. Man, that's tight. So tell the people where they can find you on social media. I am at, at freshman underscore woes on Instagram, and that's it, really. Oh, and last question. How'd you come up with the name Freshman Woes? Um, when I was younger, I used to tag Woes. I used to tag Woes82, and then from there, somehow, I came up with Freshman Woes. And it, at first, it was just like an internet handle. Like, I would use it on a message board, and then when I start, it stuck from doing uh, street teams. So when I started making beats, I just started using the same name. Like it got at a certain point, I couldn't change the name because people were already calling me that. So right. that's my name now. Like I, I shouldn't be a freshman <laughs> at my age, but I'm a <laughs> freshman forever now. I love it. So uh, again, thank you so much 
for being a guest on, man. This was so much fun. No, nah, thank you for having me, man. I'm a big fan of yours. Man, I listen to you all the time. I heard I've heard the stories about the cool J cookies, <laughs> like all that, man. <laughs> I heard the Oh man. I to the episodes with Ambush and I got to hear like a whole history of South Carolina baseball. Like I I'm, I'm just a big fan of you, man. I really appreciate you uh having me on. Bro, that means so much to me, seriously. And thank <laughs> thank you for being a guest and thank you for listening. Make sure you like, download and subscribe to since we last spoke with Danny Foxworth. Make sure you follow my YouTube channel. You can find me at Danny Foxworth 843 and there you can find all the videos for all the episodes for this podcast, as well as my baseball podcast at The Plate with Danny Foxworth. And for freshman woes and myself, this has been another episode of Since We Last Spoken. Until next time, y'all be Peace. good. Peace.